The incredible story of Mali Gambar is one of an African slave turned Indian kingmaker. So how did this remarkable life come to be? Well, let's set our time machines to 1548 and find out. Ambar was born in what is today Ethiopia. He was only 10 years old when he was forced out of his homeland and thrust into slavery. He found himself in a system where 10 to 12,000 Ethiopians were sold as slaves to the Middle East annually. After spending a decade in the Middle East, Ambar moved again. This time he went to India, in a region called the Khan. This is where he would spend the rest of his life and where he would make his claim to history. The Khan was an ethnically and culturally diverse plateau. Marathi-speaking Indians made up the majority of the Khan. But there were also Indo-Turks, Persians, Africans, a few Portuguese and Dutch merchants. The African inhabitants of the Dakar were referred to as the Habshis, a term that is still used to refer to Indians of African descent today. The African population of the Dakar, which comprised mainly of people from Sudan and Ethiopia, originally began as slave soldiers brought in to fight for different sultans of the Khan. This was a time of incredible political intrigue and betrayals in the region, and it was not uncommon for rulers to be killed by their own soldiers. The Rakhani sultan saw the African soldiers as exempt from this treacherous mindset. What the sultans did not anticipate was that, was that the African soldiers would have ambitions of their own. The Rakhan quickly became a place where African soldiers could push their way up the social and political ladder. There were numerous accounts of African soldiers holding office in the different sultanates. This is something Ambar would have discovered almost immediately. On his arrival in India, Ambar was placed under Shingas Khan, the Prime Minister of Ahmadnagar. Shingas Khan was African. Shingas Khan had many soldiers under him but he quickly distinguished Ambar from the rest, and Ambar became Khan's aide in state affairs. Khan mentored Ambar for three years, and as Ambar's prominence into the Khan was accelerating, Khan's came to an abrupt stop. Rumors had spread that Khan was conspiring against the foes of the Khan, which resulted in his assassination. Ambar was introduced firsthand to the dangers of the Khani politics. According to the Khani law, Ambar and all other soldiers under Shingas Khan were not free men. As much as he may have wanted to, Ambar did not have time to avenge his mentor's death. Ambar and the entire Dakan were under attack from a foreign and much more powerful foe, the Mughal Empire. The Dakan was one of the last independent regions in India that had not fallen to the invading Mughal Empire. The resistance against the Mughals was led by a woman named Chand Bibi. A member of Ahmad Nagar royalty, Bibi was renowned in the Dakan for her leadership in uniting the Khanis, Persians, Indo-Turks, and Africans in her fight against the Mughal invasion. Bibi promoted the idea of fidelity to the salt, a notion that promoted fidelity to the Khan instead of any one leader. Fidelity to the salt proved to be a great way to preserve peace and tolerance in the multi-ethnic region. Bibi's leadership and courage inspired and influenced many, including Ambar, who served under Bibi for 10 years. It was during his time with Bibi that Ambar received the title of Malik, which means chief in Arabic. However effective Bibi was, against the Mughals. Her leadership did not stop internal political conflicts of the Deccan. Rumors had spread that Bibi was going to betray the other royals inside with the Mughals. And with paranoia in the air, Bibi was assassinated. Mali Gambar had been moved by Bibi's resistance against the Mughals. After her death, he continued to fight against the Mughals and pledged his fidelity to the salt. Like Bibi, 
Ambar's army was multi-ethnic, and his infantry included many Habshis, Persians, and Marathis. However, Ambar knew that his small army couldn't engage in open combat with the gigantic Mughal force. So instead he used Bargi Giri, guerrilla warfare. Ambar would gather intelligence on the Mughal movements and attack their food and water supplies. During combat, he would systematically harass the Mughals, who were unaccustomed to this kind of warfare, and force them to retreat. The key to Bargigiri's success was Ambar's use of light cavalry. For this, he employed the Marathi-speaking natives of the Deccan, who are famous for their skills on horseback. By the year 1600, Ambar had 4,000 Marathi horsemen under his command. By 1609, this number had risen to 10,000, and by 1624, an estimated 50,000 Marathi horsemen served under Ambar. The large but slow Mughal army could not keep up with Ambar's quick, light cavalry. Ambar had used the Mughals' greatest strength, their size, against them. Perhaps the greatest battle between the Mughals and Ambar's men was the Battle of Badwadi. Ambar carefully chose his place of battle near the village of Badwadi, a hilly tract near the western bank of Lake Kalindi, a feeder of the Sinai River, a perfect place for guerrilla warfare. When the Mughals arrived at Badwadi, Ambar's men flooded the battlegrounds by releasing the waters of the lake the water made the ground difficult for the enemy soldiers and their horses and their elephants to move quickly. Ambar disrupted enemy supplies, cutting off food and provisions for the Mughal soldiers. And this disruption lasted so long that the enemy soldiers began defecting over to Ambar's side. At this point, Ambar soldiers only conducted repeated night attacks, but with their numbers growing and the enemy numbers depleting, Ambar finally raised the standards of Ahmad Nagar and attacked during the day. The Mughal army sustained a crushing defeat. Fuzuni Astrabadi, a Persian chronicler and contemporary of Ambar, wrote, Malik Ambar, swollen to greatness by this victory, from an ant into a snake, was enriched with wealth exceeding the treasures of Kora, and troops numerous beyond the imagination. It was through the Battle of Badwadi and other battles like it that Ambar was successful in repelling Mughal occupation. But how did Ambar maintain internal diplomacy among the nobles and leaders of the Deccan? Did he fall into the same fate as Chan Bibi and Shingas Khan? Malik Ambar had no claim to any Deccani throne for himself but he amassed enough power that he could pick which noble became the, Ni the Nizam Shah, the royal head of Ahmed Nagar. Ambar also arranged a marriage between his own daughter and the Nizam Shah. This move secured Ambar's descendants' place in the Deccan and gained Ambar further cooperation from the Nizam Shah, who made Ambar the regent minister. This made Ambar the de facto leader of Ahmed Nagar. Aside from the nobility, the common people of Ahmad Nagar favored Ambar for his rule in improving lives for the average citizen. The historian Omar H. Ali writes, Ambar's effective administration, land revenue reforms, religious tolerance, and respect for civil and criminal justice are viewed as a counterweight in, to the endemic form of corruption and opportunism that ruined lives and corroded society. For this, Ambar was both praised and remembered. After being taken from Ethiopia to Iraq and then to India, after meeting figures like Shingas Khan and Chan Bibi, after fighting off an army much larger in size, after changing the lives of those he administered, after being free, then enslaved, and then free again, Malik Ambar passed away at age 80.
leaving behind a legacy to be remembered for the ages. That wraps up our episode on Malik Ambar. What did you learn from this episode? What do you think was left out? Leave your comments below so that we could all learn and grow together. If you like our content, make sure to subscribe and join the Humble History family so you can keep up with future episodes. I'll see you on the next episode of Humble History.